you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming back. It's a thrill to see you again. Oh, Ginny, it's, it's just really nice. We get this, we get a great excuse to chat, right? We sure do. <laughs> so so um, you have a new book uh, that's launching here uh, this month in June, and it's fantastic. I got to read an advanced copy of it, Emotionally Resilient Tweens and Teens, Empowering Your Kids to Navigate Bullying, Teasing, and Social, social Exclusion. Congrats. Yeah. Thanks. You know, that, that metaphor that, you know, that we often think of like the, the new baby, it's, it's not really a new baby is a new baby. Right. But, mm -hmm. but a book is a book is along those, along those lines. Yep. Out mm -hmm. it goes in, in, into the world. And uh, with um, Aunt Ginny beside. <laughs> So um, you're well known for many other books, Simplicity Parenting, The Soul of Discipline, Being Your Best When Your Kids Are at Their Worst. There's others as well. You're a counselor, educator, consultant, and researcher for over 30 years. Um, and then you wrote this book uh, with a friend of yours. Uh, can you tell us about, about him? Yes. Luis Fernando Yosa is uh, a... An, an, um, a a dear colleague, old friend. I actually co-authored another book with him, Beyond Winning, uh, uh, Smart Parenting in a Toxic Youth Sports Environment. Um, so, and that was a, I just love working with, with uh, Luis and he's got a ton of background in this issue as well, but he's a, he's a real writer, Jenny. He's not a pretendy writer like me. He's, <laughs> he's an award-winning writer and all that sort of mm. stuff. So it's lovely to work with someone who is a, is a true craftsperson. Yeah, what a great partnership. And I think the beyond winning, the, the toxic sports culture, maybe maybe we can talk about that sometime too, because I know that's really a pertinent topic. So, so this emotionally resilient tweens and teens, you and I talked about it very briefly the last time we chatted, but it's so needed. Um, you know, this is, these are answers for kids in real time. Um, because I used to work in the school system and often um, for so many reasons, not anything, um, you know, or people are malicious or anything, but for so many reasons, it's hard for kids to solve their problems within the school system. People don't really know what's going on. You know, there's so many layers to things. And so you have written this book as a tool guide for parents and for and for children. So can you tell us a little bit about your path to this book? Yeah, my path was this, I, I guess there's a couple of layers to it. One, one of them is that uh, my work for all my adult life has been in, in helping children have a childhood, right? Children, now children, uh, exclusion, marginalization, marginalization, teasing, even bullying, I agree. It's a part of it's 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 a part of what can happen in a child's life. I I I get that, but not if it gets stuck. If it's a learning experience that increases a child's social emotional range, it increases their feeling of childhood, of friends, and ability to have friends and be confident in in a group, be able to reach out to others without fear of rejection know how to enter into a game, you know, know what to do if someone says something really mean to you. Uh, and so part of my uh, um, reason for moving into this world of what I call social inclusion, uh, it's a term I coined, gosh, 30 years ago, although, you know, you think you invent something and you absolutely haven't, you know, 50 other people have, but I think I invented that term. Um, <laughs> um, that was one path to it of just simply wanting to give children a full range of childhood and to be confident to enter into it. And teasing and exclusion is something that if it gets stuck, if it gets habitualized, uh, really does um, scar children. It it it, uh, it steals their childhood. They uh, they pull back 
from friendships. They, they either become explosive or implosive, but they just can't be their beautiful little selves anymore. And so that's all big selves. Um, and so that was one motivation, a, a, a significant motivation. A similar motivation went really at the taproot of it all with the Simplicity Parenting book, really giving children a, a childhood, very, very similar. The other motivation is a little more practical. Um, having been a school counselor and a teacher for decades, I realized how complex the school environment was. And um, I've been involved with my social inclusion program. I call it social inclusion and restorative discipline. Mm -hmm. I've been involved in that and I've worked with, it, it really is thousands of schools in setting up that, that approach. I don't call it a program. God help us from more programs, but it's a um, but it's an approach embedded, a DNA approach, and you know that can go some of the ways to helping with marginalized kids. I don't just mean bullied; I mean kids who are pushed to the edges. It doesn't always have to be as dramatic as bullying, right. but this it often, in fact, more often, it's subtle non-inclusion. Um, that was a term a seventh grade girl invented once actually said it's not like it's bullying it's just like non-inclusion and I've never forgotten that term that she she invented I thought gosh that that, that is very, very very accurate so you know I would see schools doing um, some doing uh, relatively well some doing not so well and most really struggling for consistency um, because some, some teachers will normalize it, other teachers will not. Uh, um, sometimes administration have a heavy handed, more legalistic approach, which just drives the teasing underground. And it's a really weird role model to bully a bully into stopping bullying. That, that's right. a strange behavior. So, but, the, but it's patchy and choppy. The one thing I did find tremendously successful was coaching the child who was being marginalized and giving them, he, she, they, I'll, I'll use those terms interchangeably if I may, um, giving them the, the tools and strategies and life gesture, you know, like the reposturing, emotional reposturing to be able to stand within their own power and to be able to break the cycle of exclusion. Because what I found is that the schools, even very well, very, very well functioning schools in this issue, they, um, they get, you know, they might get the kids together and they work with them and so on. And the kids who are doing the marginalization and what I call hyper controlling behavior, the kids who are socially hyper controlling and bullying, uh, uh, are spoken to and so on. But the, but the missing link um, was often, how do you coach a child who is, is being picked on? How do you coach them up? Like, as I mentioned, to stand within their own power. How, yeah. how do you coach them up to understand why this is going on, truly why? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that they can also break the cycle of reactivity that they've got themselves caught up in. And they can also not, frankly, Jenny, this, is, this might sound hard, to, hard it's a strange thing to say, but stop being so annoying. Often these kids who get picked on, there's a good percentage of them will set themselves up to be picked on, not all, by any means, not all, but a good number of them needle the kids, keep going back. It's almost like Stockholm syndrome. They keep going back to the kids who are perpetrating this behavior. And of course they do it because it's better to have that role than none. Otherwise they're invisible, right? So in order to shift those cycles, I realized as a school counselor, I could go a good part of the way. Okay, all right, so, but the people who could really be effective were, were parents. Yeah. 
they could come alongside, you know, this metaphor of canoeing where, where, where you're in choppy waters and you're paddling and, and, you're, and, and you're about to capsize and you're taking on water and into your, into your kayak. And then someone, an experienced paddler comes alongside you, gu just guides you into calmer waters, puts their mm -hmm. paddle over your, your kayak, you put your paddle over theirs, and it's this metaphor of coming alongside. Yeah. Now, I can do that to some extent as a school counsellor, as any care professional can. But right. our, our effectiveness is relatively modest compared to what a parent can do. So I started years ago very dynamically coaching parents to coach their children so that they would coach the, so that the child, because it's the child going back into the game, back into the neighborhood, back into the sports club, back into school. We can't be with them in, in no matter how much we want to, we can't. But how great is it is when we coach them in the right way, give them the right strategies that they feel they can go back into this environment with confidence to stand within their own space, to empower themselves and they come home in the afternoon or they get in the car at the end of the day and said, mum, uh, yeah, I, I did it. I totally did it. I did it by myself. That's the, now they, you know, like a mum is thinking, yay, but also mum is thinking, sweetheart, you know, I'm not saying we worked a lot together, but the feeling for the child is of that of social competency. Mm -hmm. Number one, because I did it. Um, for the tween, the teen, the child. And the, um, and the other really beautiful thing I've seen happen countless times over the years is that the, the connection with mum or dad or guardian, grandma, grandpa, mm. um, aunt or uncle, whoever has been involved in the coaching, the connection is, that, is so much deeper because the child was suffering they were socially disoriented. They didn't, and it's horrible being disoriented. Yeah. And didn't want to go to school, were worried about when was the next mean thing going to be said about them. It, were they going to be able just to walk up to a group of kids and join in the conversation? Even yeah. that caught, you know, would cause anxiety. Many of us have been in that position in our lives. Mm -hmm. But how great when it, when a guardian, a parent, can move alongside that child, that tween, that teen, and say, I gotcha, we're gonna get through this. And you know what's more? I know how to do it. Yeah. And I can tell you about it and we can figure it all out. And then you can, you can do that in school and this is gonna end. We're gonna get through this together. Mm -hmm. Together yeah. we're gonna be strong. What a message of hope for the kid. And I think, you know, I love the way that you set this book up. I've not read another book like it. You know, you have these opening chapters where you explain a lot, you know, you give a lot of insight. And then, you know, the rest of the book are actual stories from children who have been experiencing different situations of isolation, cyberbullying. You go through all sorts of different scenarios and, and what they did. And it took me back. It took me right back to that seventh grade, you know, that fifth grade and and how it feels. And I think so the kids are really going to be able to see themselves in these stories and take advice from someone who just went through it um, and how they made it. end. it's is a phenomenal book. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine a, a way that would be more impactful than to read the story of someone else who also was right there in it and who found a way out. Um, so I know parents and, and kids are going to just find this such a great tool. Uh, something, so something that ran as a theme through the book, which I was surprised actually, um, was that you came back a lot of times to a full, strong family life and, um, and how that is going to help kids with this, you know, isolation at school. Um, so, so why the family? What does that do uh, for a kid who is struggling? You know, like uh, I think a, a metaphor we mentioned last time we spoke, Ginny, was that of the safe harbor, of, of family being a safe harbor. 
um, it's not that we want to like when it when it when a when a, a, a child a tween a teen gets in the car at the end of the day and is grumpy and withdrawn and doesn't want to talk and then later on it, it comes out they're just totally they just totally are mean to me they just and, and the story comes out right um, it's it's horrible. A child, a tween is never, never bullied. A family is. It impacts the whole family. It, it, it so does. And the, the harbor metaphor is that, you know, we, we, don't, we, we, we want to, when our child tells us something like that, just, just gather them in, wrap them up, protect them, and it's all good. It's all normal. Mama bear, papa bear. Um, just, you know, come, come in. But we can't stay that because the child has to go back to school. They have to go back out into the neighborhood. And that's where the harbor comes into our families. We are at our best, totally at our best, when, when our children can sail out of, frankly, bumpy and stormy waters of, of social isolation, of being a, a little boat cut out from the flotilla. Right, They're, and and they no longer have that navigation of the other children moving forward in their lives, and they and they're on their own. It's it's horrible for a child. Yeah. It's very primal and instinctual how um, anxiety producing that is for a child, for for an adult, mm -hmm. for anyone. Right. Um, as adults, we've got a functional front uh, functioning frontal lobes. We can cope well, on a good day, <laughs> um, but we can but we can cope with it, right? But uh, ish, but for children, it's total. Now, the family, if a child can can sail their their bruised and battered and tattered boat back into family at the end of the day, and that big harbor wall <laughs> comes around. Mm -hmm. And the, and the water in there is, is calmer and where they moor their little metaphoric boats is predictable. And we have rhythm in our family, mm. predictability in our family. We, we have the, all the unpredictability of the playground, not knowing what's coming up. Mm. When we have that kind of, of little rituals, little things that we do, we wrap our ki kids up in those, familiar family stories. Family stories are hugely important when a child's getting bumped and bruised, mm -hmm. either physically or, or emotionally in the playground, because there's a feeling of, we are us. You know what, you know, um, Jacob, Jennifer, Miguel, Michelle, you come from good people. You come from good people. And yeah. here are our stories and here's your, what your grandpa did. And here's what I did when I was a little boy, when I was quite naughty, they love those stories. Um, but you, and to have our children see our home life, again, continuing this metaphor of the safe harbor as a place to, 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 mm. to retreat to, to restock, restore, to repair, frankly, yeah. and, to, and to prepare for going out into those bumpy seas the next day. And so much of this book is about that space, is about how we can help our children in that karma environment, knowing full well they'll need to go back out again, go back out fully provisioned, sails mended, if I may continue this metaphor, strong, ready, compass bearing set. I know what to do when that child calls me four eyes or stupid, or when, when, that, when they um, exclude me from, I have my compass bearings and I know exactly what I am gonna do when they start calling me names again. Yeah. I've got my mum and dad, my grandma, grandpa, my aunt and uncle, my, my family friends have gotten around me I've got my compass bearings. I can go back out into that playground and I can be good. But, but Ginny, it begins at home. Yeah, it, that makes me, I'm emotional. Yeah, oh, right. It's, it's right. big. 
is you say you say strengthen the family base camp and i i really was surprised to see that be such a strong theme but it makes sense and when you look at the way that family is structured today well first of all it seems like maybe the harbor doesn't exist so much because of online um a screen time right and social media so that's following kids home and then we're so busy you know so if you don't have those expanses of time to spend together um you know you may not have that family base camp and and i thought it was such a message of hope kim because you know you say it's these are easy things move in closer you know go get some ice cream go on a go on a bike ride and i think that sometimes we um we don't gravitate toward those simpler solutions because, you know, they seem like maybe they won't matter. Oh, you know, I've talked to, I was just talking to um, a mum. I'm sure she would mind me saying, of course I won't mention her name, but um, uh, just, um, just yesterday of a boy who was, I, I have, I still have a, a, you know, obviously a family, you know, um, counseling practice at this, otherwise it's just irrelevant, right? Unless you're right. speaking with parents every day. And um, the mum was telling me just yesterday that the boy had a really difficult day, had a had a really socially complicated, difficult day. And uh, they tended to eat fairly good food in this family. It was a thing, right? And the child got in the car and was grumpy and was just compressed, not, yeah. de not necessarily depressed, but pushed in. I often think what bullying and teasing does is it doesn't depress, it compresses. Yeah. And um, it makes you feel smaller. Pressure is put on you. Anyway, she said to this uh, nine, nine or so year old, hey, you know what? Why don't we go and get some Dairy Queen? Now, this is a family that just doesn't do that, right? And the boy right. said, really? And she said, uh-huh. Let's let's get Dairy Queen, and you know what? Let's just go the long way, and we'll stop on that hill where we see the horses, and on the way back, and let's just get out and watch the horses and see if they come over to us. Wow! And the boy then uh, got the ice cream. <laughs> um, Dairy Queen, for goodness sake. She said, I don't know what possessed me to say that. It just came out of my mouth. Anyway, but and they got the ice cream. They drove up to the top of the hill, they got out, they had the ice cream, the horses came over, the little boy gave the horse a lick of his ice cream and then continued to eat it himself, of course. <laughs> Great. Of course. Good for right. the immune system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. And then he got home and he said, you know, mum, this day is not turning out so bad after all. Wow. Now you've wow. got to believe, I have to believe that, that that child at the end of the day, that nine-year-old is going to put his head down on the pillow that night and sleep, yeah. knowing yeah. that there are people in the world and that there are people who will slow down their world. Because the thing I didn't mention is this mum had a thousand and one things to do. Yeah, sure. But she just pushed those aside and, and knew she would be up a little later that night catching up on emails, as she said, but she pushed that aside and said, um, I, I talk about this in the book as stop the world. Yes, yes. Stop the world. Mm -hmm. If your child, the, 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 the research into this is that kids dramatically under-report social exclusion issues. Mm. If your child ever says, there's a few who may, who may over-report, but that is a tiny minority. Most kids, it's a real tip of the iceberg metaphor, um, is that they under-report. So if your child says something to you about what's going wrong at school, you've you, you got to hold your stuff together, right? Because all we want to do is go pound on the principal's desk. Yeah. Right? Um, and start talking badly about the other family, which is a really bad idea, right? Mm -hmm. To talk badly about the other kids and the other family, because secretly that little boy, that child, that tween, that teen is hoping that one day they can make friends with them. Yeah. So if you're dissing them and their family, it's, it makes it even more hopeless for the child because they'd like to be friends with them and it conflicts them. Yeah. But, um, 
in that moment, she pushed all that aside, stop the world. We're going to go do some stuff. This weekend, they're, they're going cycling um, together. And yeah. she's going to think of a few other things that her, um, she's a single mom, single mom. That's such a silly term, single mom. She's a double mom. Mm -hmm. Mom, double trouble, double shift, double love, double everything. She's a double mom. Um, but she's soloing, I, I get it. And um, and she's going the extra mile and seeing if she can reach out to some extended family and they are going to do mm -hmm. stuff. Great idea. They're going to do stuff together the whole weekend. <laughs> yeah, great idea. I, I think I loved that part of the book. And, and like I said, it hit me by surprise. You say set up a family game night, read out loud, bake or cook, launch into that tree fort project. These things really matter. They really matter when it comes to how our kids are processing. And what about the slowing down? I mean, you talk about stop the world. There was, you know, you talked sort of a lot about how and kids are sort of they're at their limit already, then it makes it harder for them uh, to deal with what's going on at school. Yeah, the illustration in the book kind of says it all. I, um, Catherine, my wife, has illustrated all my eight books. I've got this in-house awesome. art department. That's awesome. <laughs> and my daughters. Are I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, yeah. And my two daughters are illustrating uh, uh, our next book. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's fantastic. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Um, so the... Um, the, the illustration kind of says it all because what Catherine drew uh, was, you know, like I'm, I, I, you know, like I'm still recovering from the best education money could buy, Jenny, right? Mm -hmm. it, my wife went through Waldorf education. So I, t I do this impoverished thing. I talk and she draws it and says, is this what you meant? She holds it up and it's like, oh my goodness, it's exactly what I meant. It's such a skill that these kids have that, that go through that, that, that education and, and others too. But so um, what she drew was a tap pouring into a cup mm -hmm. and, the, and then there is overflow coming down the side. Yeah. Now, the reason she drew that from what I, uh, the way I was speaking about this is that, that the tap, the faucet, is like the, the flow of life. That's all the things that are coming into the cup of the child's little emotional being, the soul, however we put it, but into mm -hmm. like there's all the play dates, the scheduling stuff, the, the media, the homework, the sports clubs, the friendships. There's a lot coming into that cup, a lot. Mm -hmm. And when kids, uh, particularly when they are socially excluded, you would think that less is coming into that cup, but it's not true, more is, right? Because they, the volume is, it's, 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 it's their, their, the anxiety produces this feeling of overwhelm, yeah. everything. Now, when a child, in a child's life in general, but particularly when they're struggling socially or behaviorally, I might add too, um, We've got a choice. Do we spend our lives mopping up spillage? Because the spillage is behavior. Spillage is anxiety. Spillage is anger. Spillage is, is defiance, is stubbornness. Do we spend our life mopping up spillage? Or do we turn down the tap? Wow. Now, That's powerful. Right? And, it and sure so, is. So turning down the tap is crucially important when a child wow. is being isolated. And, and it's hard to turn down the tap because last time we spoke about yeah. this is that the new normal is like a fire hydrant level of just the new normal is mm -hmm. soccer on Monday and ballet on Tuesday and then uh, uh, you know uh, piano lessons on Thursday and psychotherapy on Friday to cope with it all and it's just like more and you look around the neighborhood and everyone is living this this fast-paced life and you think if I don't give my kids this life they're going to miss out this is not childhood this is a this is an enrichment opportunity I, I must get my kids all I can 18 years worth of development into the first eight years, then they'll be good. You know, it's like, right. it's like parenting becomes like a, like an arms race. Yeah. And, but you know, when, a, but where this really, I think 
um, has an extra special gut instinctual truth to it is when our kids are suffering because of friendships that have broken up. Mm. Boyfriends, girlfriends, friendships, being excluded, being belittled. Because we know then we need to slow things down. We know that if we keep living life at this pace, mm -hmm. it's just the tap has just been turned up and the spillage is, is um, well, it can really lead to a lot of emotional issues, yeah. to say the very least. Yeah, it's such a great metaphor. I think parents will really get so much out of that. You had a couple phrases in this book that um, I hadn't heard before. One is harmony addiction. Uh, you say... Mm -hmm. We have this widespread aversion to conflict in our society. We want every day to be a happy one. We're trying to push away difficulties. But you, you do talk about um, a lot about the benefits of kids being able to work through these different issues, you know, that we're able to help them. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, it's good for them to solve their own problems and the growth they experience. So can we talk about that? You, talk, you know, what was really interesting was the coming of age. Um, mm. that was a part in your book, the coming of age in different societies and, and how those are really difficult. They're not some easy little ceremony. So what are the benefits when kids learn to cope and, and work through these different problems that mm. they're experiencing? Well, I'm so glad you picked that up because it's, it, it's, it, it, it's a very dear to my heart. And when I was speaking to the, to, um, the editor and to, and to, uh, and to Luis about the book, there was the question of whether to include that or not. So you think we made the right choice? I do. I thought it was fascinating. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> good. A really, a really good parallel I had never thought of before. Um, no one has ever, you know, I I've never read anything about that before and it fit right in. Good. Hooray. Um, I'm gonna tell my editor later today, Ginny Sand. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> it makes uh, it make a lot of sense, doesn't it? Just because yes. you know, one of the things that I write about, as as you read, is that um, is that all 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 societies through thousands of years have had this rite of passage, this coming of age, and I've witnessed personally two or three of them, you know, like in in, in person, and um, they they have this 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 aspect of of actually in the, in the book, I break it down, but just to nutshell it now, I talk about there's a process that in all, all coming of age, there's, there's a stage of isolation where kids, where kids are isolated. You know, they go to like they're sent to caves or so on. But I, I juxtapose that, like I parallel that with in social isolation, it's the same deal. It's the right. same deal. I, I tell you, here's the traditional rites of passage and here, right alongside it, is how I think social conflict is also a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. It is a rite of passage, right? Yeah. So, so isolation is a key one. Then the next one, often kids go through these um, endurance uh, tests, mm -hmm. right, in, in tribal yeah. practices. But you know, like when, it, when you're falling out with your friends or you're being teased or you're not, you're being you know, told, no, teams are already picked, you can't play. Or, you know, or you walk up to a group of girls and they just look at you and just do that classic, like, mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It's so subtle. Yeah. But you have to endure. That is such a lot of, I've got to get through this. Somehow I have to get through this. So there's endurance. Yeah. Now, the third step is, uh, is um, in all tribal practices, there's this stage of what social psychologists, anthropologists call liminality or topsy-turvy or upside down or basically disorientation. They deliberately do it to kids. They disorient them, right? When we are going, when our child, our teen or tween is going through social conflict, my goodness, that is so disorienting. That is like, oh my. Now, the really interesting thing, and again, the way Catherine drew this, see here we are again mm -hmm. is that she drew this as a helix so what she drew is that when you are at, at when you are being disoriented you then move through mm -hmm. and then you and then change happens yeah. change when you are at your most disoriented that's really painful stuff 
then in tribal practices change that's when you're given your spirit name that's when you uh, you you uh, um, are, are welcomed into the community in a new way but in bullying and teasing and isolation change can happen there is learning there is i am stronger for this experience mm -hmm. i am stronger yeah as long as you don't get stuck as long like as you don't at the get very stuck. beginning yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the last stage, and this is the crucial one, is now I belong. You wow. know, in, in tribal practices, you get your goat and a crow. That was in, in Africa, uh, uh, one that I was personally present. The, the young, the, this was a male ceremony where, the, the, where now the young male was given a goat, a crow, and, was, um, and could build his own little hut there and so on and so on. But in, so, in social conflict, when we make it through all that, we don't only belong to the class, to the playground in a new way. We belong to our family in a new way. But most importantly, we belong to ourselves yeah. in a new way. So therefore, and at the, you know, at the end of that ch little chapter, it's pretty brief, really. But what I write is, look, belonging is not a right. It's mm. a process. Our kids won't always belong. They will fall out. There will be squabbles and there will be fights. And, and we mustn't get harmony addicted where every day mm -hmm. has to be a crystal rainbow or a balancing experience. Yeah. Right. Or otherwise right. something's wrong. Right. I like what you said when you said children experience and grow so much uh, more by working through and solving issues. It's the foundation of all learning, academic and social. So trying to protect our kids in the long run, um, you know, could set them a little bit behind, I think. Well, you know, and, and here's the thing to me is that is that in all traditional practices, I'm kind of going backwards and forwards between these two things. The whole idea is that of growing a kid up. That's the whole idea, right? Of them coming into themselves in, you know, well, conflict does that, right? But he, but, but here's the thing, and I've, I've been in the United States for 25 years now. I know when you say, here's the thing, you've got to say something good. Here's the thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> when people used to say, here's the thing, I'd say, oh, and they, 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 yeah. they, <laughs> they wouldn't say anything. Anyway, but here's the thing, is, is, that, <laughs> is that in all those practices, there, was, there were tribal elders guiding it so that it didn't get stuck. See, that's your point, right? It, yeah. And, and the, and the, and the, it's actually and, your point. I'll give you the credit. <laughs> well, well it's, <laughs> it's, it's our point. So, but it's a, um, but it's a point, yes, it's a mm -hmm. point I made, but which stood out to you, which, you know, it's, 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 I'm so glad you picked it up because the question's got, then got to be asked, who are the new tribal elders? Mm. Who are they? Yeah. And how are those societies set up? Right. right. They're, they don't have the faucet turned up all the way, you know. Um, the and... new tribal elders are us. <laughs> it's yeah. us. It's us. Now we think, what? Me? A tribal elder? Mm -hmm. Like, mm, I don't think so. You know, like, I'm not wise. And I, but, you know, when our kids are hurting, we, we have to, we've got no choice yeah. because a lot of those structures of the past have fallen away. We don't have them anymore. Yeah. It's our chance to step up. And that's what this book is trying to do. It's saying it's almost like an, an eldering guide. Really? Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's what it tries well, to do. Well, when you said earlier, you said the fourth stage is now I belong. Now I belong. And I, and it, made me think about all of the stories and there's a lot of stories in there you know nine ten chapters of stories um from different children and that's how they all end I they believe. all end in a place where they belong they belong you know either to a new group of friends or the old group of friends they belong um you know in their family they feel a bigger connection and you know and to themselves they come into their own you know uh, you, you, you it's amazing. it's you did a really deep read of this actually because to pick these points up because if you look at every one of these stories mm -hmm. in order to walk its talk walk our talk for Luis and I we, 
the stories had to echo that that journey. So all yeah. the stories, and they're real, by the way. Sure These do. stories are um, they're, they're composites because I wanted to protect the identity of the the kids. But they are real. These aren't just made up fictional stories. These come from 30 years of coaching kids through isolation, right? And they all begin with the isolation, the sticking mm -hmm. to it, the enduring. But in that enduring phase, it's how do I endure? Are my parents beside me? I can get through this. I know I'm alone in the playground, but I don't have to be alone in my life. With my, I've got my family. I, I can endure if my if my dad is teaching me, my mom or my grandma is yeah. teaching me how to how to stand up for this and how to not inflame the situation, but stand within my own power. Uh, and so, what the stories are doing is actually going through that phase. And often, I don't know if you picked, you probably did actually. A, a lot of the stories will say will 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 example how a child tried to do something and it just didn't work out it made the situation worse yes it made yeah. it and worse. what i what i really loved and i think um is so important for a teen or tween to read is that i saw these kids looking around right what's working for somebody else and i think that's such a life skill you know, when we have the ability to say, okay, so you gave some different examples and I came up more than once. So um, I thought it was really powerful. You know, maybe you have a kid that's overweight and they would say, well, I'm not the only overweight kid in my class, but those kids are not getting teased. What, what's the difference? And, and, and sometimes even those kids would go ask and oh, what a powerful life skill to be able to ask someone else, what is working for you? You know, it's not working for me. What is working for you? And they're finding their answers from their peer group. Um, I loved that part of the book. And that was set up by the, by the, the parent or the cousin or the older person yes. who was guiding the child through because they often said, you know, and this is one of the secrets, the book has got three or four secrets. Mm -hmm. And one of the secrets is, you know, you think you're being teased or not included because you're, you're round and big in your body, or you think you're being teased because you're too skinny or you wear glasses or because you have a funny accent. You think that, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the secret. The secret and it's a great secret, but it's a hard secret. I've said this to so many kids over the years. Do you want to know the secret? And, and you know, even teenagers, you get their eyes on high beam, right? You know, because they eat a lot of low beam, you know, eye contact, but you get their eyes on high beam. It's like, yeah. <laughs> a, a little Everyone kids, wants to know the secret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, the secret is that they are doing this to you to control you. They are doing this to actually, for little kids I talk about, to be your boss. Mm -hmm. For older kids I talk about, they are trying to do this to make you small because they're feeling small. And what they do is that they take your power in order to feel big. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it. And the only way they can do this to you is if you give it to them. Now you, and, and like kids look at me like, well, are you blaming me? Like, are you blaming me for this? So pretty quickly, you know, as a mom or a dad, you have to follow up and say, no, 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 sweetheart. There's no blame in this at all. There's just the secret that they're doing this, mm -hmm. that they're trying to control you by having mean fun. And every, and here's the thing is that, is that the way you're reacting, you're being so brave. You're, you've tried shouting at them. You've tried, you've, you've tried telling teachers. You've tried, um, you, you've tried fighting them, hitting them. You've tried running away. You've tried, you've tried walking away. None of it's worked, right? But how brave you've been. But you know what? There is a way. There is a way. And that's what this book, that's what this book does is in the 10 stories, it shows the way to stand inside your power, to be strong, 
um, in cyberbullying, in physical bullying, in malicious rumors, all the classics, mm -hmm. all the yeah. all the unfortunately classic ways that kids get at each other. But they're all about, and that's why I use the term interchangeably with bullying. I use the term hyper controlling. Right. Right, because the word bullying, I get it. I use it because it, it's 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 we have that in our in, in our language in our vernacular. Yeah. But what it really is in so many situations is it's one kid trying to hyper control another, or a group of kids trying to hyper control. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and 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 then it, it, that term then leads to a it leads somewhere. Like why, why is mm -hmm. it? And it leads to a little bit of insight, maybe certainly, it, 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 or hopefully, it leads to compassion for the kids who sure. are targeting others. It's like they're doing this because they're living in an out of control world. And the only way they know to control the world is to control what they can control. And that's uh, the playground, because that's yeah. their domain. They can control the playground and they will. Yeah. Now, the quickest way to control is to find a kid who's reactive. Mm -hmm. now, this is a, this is, you probably saw this is a main point. That's reactivity. Is, is that is the reactivity flames is what you yep. say yeah mm -hmm. and the point of the book is to give alternatives to is you have to you have to do something you can't just stand there and take it or even if you try and walk away and you walk away all kind of anxious nervous or steamed up the kids will just follow you that advice we give kids just ignore it number one mm -hmm. and just walk away number two it's okay advice, but it's how you ignore it and how you walk away. And that's what these stories that particularly Luis wrote so beautifully, this was yeah. largely Luis's work in the stories, um, illustrate in, and it's not just one size fits all. For example, there's a story in that book, uh, Joey's story where he isn't teased, he isn't bullied, but, he wants to fit in to the basketball sort oh, of yeah. thing and yes. he wants to fit in and he's putting all his social eggs in one basket. So what that story does is it, is it illustrates how he figured out with the help of his dad, how he was going to, well, that's that story. It's a true story. Uh, he goes off with his dad in the summer and he finds a youth theater group. Mm -hmm. And, his and dad, a girl. And a, and a girl, and it's really true. It's really yeah. true, he finds the girl. Um, and, uh, but it's not a girlfriend. It's a, right. it's a girl who's a friend and his dad's a carpenter and, uh, and Joey learns how to build the sets for, and for the first time in years, he is just completely valued by yeah. the group. And he grows and grows. And by the time summer comes back, he walks back onto that school campus, you know, having grown a, a, an emotional foot. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. I mean, that was a fantastic story. They're yeah. all, um, I just love that you hit them all. You hit the ones where the kids, you know, are feeling shy, you know, the ones where they're just being excluded, you know, for no reason, they can't really figure it out. You know, ones where kids are getting teased. You brought this up a minute ago, but I had written this down. Um, I not heard harmony addiction before, and I'd actually not heard people use the phrase mean fun. And I thought that that was really eye-opening. You said they're having mean fun at your expense. And that phrase came up a lot because I think a lot of times we just say they're being mean, you know, but but by putting it that way, it's very eye opening. You understand a little bit more about what's going on. And so the solution, one solution that I saw sort of thread its way all the way through is you're just trying to take away the fun, you know, the fun part. And you talk about a lot about cutting off the oxygen. Yep. Yep. Being not not giving oxygen to the fire. Uh, 10, 11 year olds tend to understand that metaphor really well. The little ones, as I mentioned, they understand don't make them your boss. Um, you know, obviously you've got to, you've got to tone this according to the age of the child. Right. That term mean fun, by the way, Jenny, I didn't invent that. That was an 11th grade girl. 
Wow. She said, you know, what this really is, is that they're having mean fun at your, ex she was um, she was talking to a fifth grade girl. In all the schools I work with, like so I work with schools, I, I work mostly with kids who are targeted, but whole schools to set up social inclusion approaches. In all the schools I work with, I set up a student social action committee. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this is the the tenth and the most I, I think made for movie story of Darpan, number ten, the story that I, I uh, Luis and I had the just several times writing that story. I, I, I teared up just remembering these mm -hmm. kids. Um, and what this girl was saying in the eleventh grade is because of this because she was a member of the student social action committee who are trained to be out on the playground helping be proactive before the problems escalate so they're trained to spot kids who are not being included spot yeah. kids who are being annoying and therefore excluded and yeah. they move in and they work with it but they're also trained to actually counsel kids but not just regular peer counseling because it's not it's 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 vertical mm -hmm. and i and she was the one that came up with that she was talking to a little girl called amelia and she said you know what this really is is mean fun mm -hmm. and amelia the little girl um the younger one looked up at sophie and she looked up and said that's exactly mm -hmm. it that's it and it was such a moment that it really stayed with me and she said so so we have to not allow them to have mean fun using you right they can have and and, and this girl she's 11th grader so clearly she you know she was really these kids who like our, you know our schools we have clubs for athletic excellence and academic excellence and artistic excellence but where are our clubs for social and emotional excellence where yeah. are they and that's what the student social action committees do and then so she said the bigger girl said to the younger said to the younger one you know you'll be doing these kids a favor if you stop them having mean fun yep then maybe oh. they can just have fun fun wow wow and it's like you're handing them a gift that's a really good perspective and it worked out wow. you, it worked out this girl broke the cycle um wow. she was one of the um these kids in in the book we talk about don't be put on the witness stand did you pick mm -hmm. that up yep like often kids who are being excluded get cross-examined they get asked all these questions and they get fired at and they get you know like and, and these rumors start up and they they go at them and that story uh was also had a a, a, a racial overtone as well in that in the book yeah but who said and this is what this this girl you know i uh, said like who said that they get to put you on the witness stand mm -hmm. Who was the most powerful person in a courtroom? The person on the witness stand or the attorney asking all the questions? Yeah. Now, who, who gave those kids? And this 11th grade girl was a little bit, she was a, she was a feisty one. I still remember her to this day. She was a feisty one. She said, who gave them the right to be the people who cross-examine you? No one gave them the right to do that. No one. <laughs> she was quite I love it. Well, I love you. You have all these diffusing statements, you know, for a kid to say, that's oh, fine, you can say that or even to say, yeah, you're right. I'm not the fastest one on the team. Oh, well, you know, that these that sort of ran through the book, too, which is they really gave the tools. These are the tools. And also, also, I think with each one, it takes time. Yeah, a couple weeks, you know, it's not something that's over within a day. And, and I also thought that was a really important part of the book for kids to read that for parents to know, this isn't a, a fix that's going to happen in 24 hours, it might take a little while. Um, you know, but that there is hope in the end of it. Generally, generally it takes, I've, I've watched this over the years, because I've coached uh, countless, many countless hundreds of kids through this. And, um, uh, and I've watched how long it takes. Mm. And when a child is well accompanied by mum and dad, by, by their guardians, parents, 
when they get to, to decompress, when their life, when that tap is turned down a little bit, basically when you create the conditions and you coach them up into, yeah, because kids, they, yeah, 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 they get all this sort of stuff, but they want to know what to say. Right, and it's in there. Right? It's right? in there. It's totally yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now when those conditions are set up in, in a way that is, absolutely doable this is all simple yes they're simple you tell them what to say and you tell them to practice practice, practice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It. i know mm -hmm. it's it. you say like you know when you learn lines for a play they don't feel like they feel a bit weird but after a while you can say them without looking at the book and then after a right. little while you can just say them that, that like they're you okay yeah. so but you know the, the the thing is is if the conditions are right if you establish the conditions to slow things down at home coach your kids, be with them, be more present. Generally, the teasing stops within seven to 10 days, done, stopped. Yep. Now, here's the really interesting thing. I don't think we put this in the book, but I still get little cards and texts and emails now from a bunch of kids. Uh, I was in one school as a school counselor for a long, long time. And I, I used to teach these lessons proactively. It wasn't just waiting for it to come up. I'd teach them yeah. as a part of the curriculum. And uh, I still get letters and it's predominantly from young women. Some guys do, but guys don't tend to you know, write. And, right. but, but I think it's from young women uh, who are now in their 30s and 40s even, some of them. I'm an old guy now. Um, uh, who write and say, do you remember that stuff? Do you remember all that stuff about emotional resiliency that you taught us? And I and I love it because many of them still write real cards. Wow. And they say, I just want to tell you, I just I, I, I have been meaning to do this for ages. That thing about standing in your own power and not being reactive as a woman in the workplace has helped wow. me get promotion, has helped me stand in. Uh, one that arrived a month or two back was a woman who was an engineer in a totally male dominated uh, um, uh, um, business. And she said, these guys think I'm the coolest person because I never react. I look right at them and I know exactly what to say. And then she wrote, she's a really funny kid. She said, you know what? It was exactly what you taught me to say in third grade. <laughs> right? Wow. Wow. In the sentence, because these guys can be like little boys sometimes. I this honestly, I, I had that out on my desk for days, just reading that wow. through. It so made me smile. Because people still want to control. Well, you see, these lessons, if we as parents teach our kids these lessons, or care professionals or educators, they're not just a lesson to help kids navigate the playground. They then that yes, yes, they are, but they are. Uh, immeasurably, if I may, you know, my own bias, useful all through their lives in myriad situations. I've, yeah. I've had people write to me who, are, who have got out of really like situations that were borderline domestic violence, and they were able to wow. stay in a non-reactive, powerful space, be able to find their way through that relationship or end it but without escalating it, because otherwise they've written wow. you know, to me, they would have been in physical danger. Yeah. So wow. these life lessons. Yes, yes. I mean, I think, you know, I have so many pages here, Kim. I got so much out of this book. I think, you know, there's very few books where I say, this is one that you should have on your shelf. I think Simplicity Parenting is one, um, obviously, and obviously millions of families do have that on their shelves. And this is the same, because like you said, kids are going to experience different problems and different things that they're going through. And you have gone through all of the different scenarios and given tools, practical tools that kids can use today, kids can use tomorrow in schools that are sort of overburdened, um, you know, where things are sneaky. I think that's the hardest part is that the adults a lot of times cannot really help. Yep. Because it's and, sneaky. You know, and one thing we haven't touched much on today is that is the extra sneakiness of cyberbullying. Mm. Right. And so there is this whole section of uh, we decided to write it in real life bullying. Here's how this looks. But in virtual life bullying, here's how it is so much more pernicious yes. in real life. And we take each situation 
and then break it down and say, if your child is cyber bullied um, and over 50% now, we've actually broken the threshold, over 50% of all bullying involves cyber bullying. Um, there's still a minority of bullying situations that are exclusively online, but over 50%, and I would, I would posit a guess that it's more than that, but academics can, can actually show that, but in the low 50 percentile, involves cyberbullying. So we have to coach our kids into how to handle yeah. this. Um, we have to teach them, here is how you disconnect from this, but you can disconnect without being disempowered. Yes. And, yeah. and so here's, here's how, and we go through step by step, um, it sounds like an advertisement tried and proven, but there's been a lot of stuff over the years, honestly, Ginny, that I've tried. Nothing else is working. It hasn't worked. Nothing else yeah. is working. And I, and I worked in the schools and I know, you know, it, it really does come down to that individual child. And so what you have done is you have given them the empowerment to deal with it now. And then, like you said, this is for their life. This is a lifelong um, skill set that they will have. I liked what you talked about um, real quick because I know we're running out of time, but it was it was counterintuitive to me. You know, there's this really big push for kids to have smartphones. And as parents, I think we feel that they're going to be isolated if they don't have them as a third grader, as a fourth grader. Um, but you say a lot of times what that does is it really points out how isolated they are because yes. what they're seeing is all the things that they weren't included on. Exactly. And one of the things, because um, we uh, gave this manuscript at various stages to a student social action committee at the Alice Burney School in California in Sacramento, just an outstanding group of kids, outstanding school. And... Um, uh, this, the, the kids in this public school really took the stories apart and said, you know, you should change this, that. What about this? You could do that. And each one of the kids, they have 30 kids in their eighth grade who are out there every recess with the kids. They're out there every, every morning at drop-off to help kids who are going through school refusal and sad to come into the classroom. Wow. Every time, every... Uh, day at pickup there they are saying goodbye to their little buddies and so on anyway they they actually um, pointed this out as well they said what parents and this is so interesting from kids right yeah they said what parents don't understand about smartphones is that that is how you you hand your kid a smartphone they don't know how to use it they don't and because it's so anonymous they start forming these exclusive clicks and we don't even see them. You guys, you adults don't even see them because they're online and then they don't know how to handle them. And they said, they straight up, do not give little kids smartphones. They just said, just don't do that. You give it and this, you put, you, you said almost the same as them. You think you're doing this to have them included, but you're giving them this weapon of exclusion. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they're too little. They don't know how to handle it. Yeah. And a front row seat to all the things that they didn't get invited to, to all the friends that are getting together without them. And, and when we were kids, we didn't see it. We're home with our families in the safe harbor. Um, but that's following them home. I, ca I cannot say um, enough how much I enjoyed this book. And what was interesting was that you and I talked about it the last time we talked and, and you were, you seemed a little shaky about it because you said, you know, this is a different approach. You know, we have this story-based approach and I'm not really sure. So, you know, I came into it with that lens, you know, thinking, oh, you know, I wonder, you know, I wonder how, and it's just a slam dunk. It's a phenomenal book. I think it's, it's going to change the world for children, uh, for their lifetime, for families. Like you said, that bullying is actually a family problem. It's going to change people's family dynamics. So when this podcast airs, your book will be already available. People can go buy it right now. And just um, a fabulous reference book uh, for every family to have on, on their shelves. Um, Obviously, they're going to be able to buy on Amazon because that's where many people buy books. But um, I'm imagining everywhere else, correct? Yes, absolutely. Barnes and Noble and um, yeah. it's you know, a all the different. Publisher. Um, yeah. Yep, it's going to be everywhere. Um, and if people want to find more about you and, and follow along. Well, you said there's another one. 
Did I catch that right? Oh, yes. You know, yeah, it, did I catch it? There is. I keep thinking, okay, no more books. <laughs> no, um, more books, more books. We're all saying more books. Yeah, you know, no, the, the next book is even a bigger departure, Jenny. So, so you're, okay, so you're the first to know. Don't tell anyone, right? Okay. Uh, but the, um, the next book is actually a, 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 a movement down in, in age group because this book was for tweens and teens. Yeah. Although a lot of parents of younger kids of six, seven, eight year old, nine yes, year old. Yes, absolutely. Because that also, stuff starts early. Yep. Mm -hmm. But the next book is for little kids, two, three, four year old. And it's actually for them. It's a, it's a, it's a picture book. Wow. And... <clears throat> the, the working title uh, is Georgie Knows What's Coming Next. And it's all around the world, little children who are at various, as the sun rises around the world, they, um, they, they know because of the rhythm and predictability in their life, they know what's coming next. Like Wei Chin in China feels a rumble and a tumble in her tummy and she knows what's coming next. And you turn the page, and there she is with her with her chopsticks, eating her her food. And and for a child who has a little bit of a choppy day, how lovely to sit down with these astonishingly beautiful, lively paintings that my children are doing. That's just, that's incredible. <laughs> and they can see, even if their day has been a little bit arrhythmical, right? A little three-year-old, and mum had to do this, and daddy got home late, and. Uh, they can look through this book and just get this settling feeling that all is well because we know what's coming next. Yes, That's this yes. book. Oh, I can't wait. I'm so <laughs> glad. I'm so glad you're doing another one. Well, Kim, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. What an amazing conversation. Uh, what an amazing book. I mean, I just... I, I poured through it and, and it really did. It took me back to my own childhood. You know, I thought, oh, I wish I would have had some of these tools. And I know that there is not, there is not a family out there that, that could not use this book. So it's a great one for totally, gifts, yeah. grandparents to buy, you know, um, to and Jenny, you totally to don't have to wait until your kids being isolated. Exactly. It's exactly. really good to know. I like what you said that you used to teach this proactively so the kids can be on the lookout for it. And even like you talked about, there was a spot where it talked about um, how meaningful it is to be friendly to an overlooked person. I, I have this statement bolded being friendly to an overlooked person can make a bigger difference to them than we realize all of these things we should never underestimate the power of having just one person in our life who values us there are so many lessons throughout here that um that go above and beyond you know exclusion and and bullying just about how to treat people and how to live life and and how we can really make a difference in the lives of others so um, I know it's it's a huge project, like you said, a birth, a birth of ideas um, to get all those words out there. It's almost 300 pages. It's a fantastic read. Um, so thank you for the book and, and thank you for your time. It's always so lovely to speak to you, Jenny. You just go right to the heart of things. You really uh, well, It was a gift to me. I mean, I can't ever have imagined that I would get to sit across from you not once, but actually twice. So so all my uh, all my gratitude to you and to your family, to your wife for the beautiful illustrations. And uh, we'll be looking forward to the next one. Well, it once, twice, and then thrice is like a fairy tale. <laughs> it's got to happen. <laughs> Thank you. I, ho I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Um, I hope book launch, book launch is going to go fantastic for you. It's a really needed book. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks.